Hi, today we're going to be building a six digit LED clock. So in a previous video, I mentioned that I had six of these Kingbright 2.3 inch seven segment displays. And we're going to build these up onto some pad board, which I've cut to approximately the correct size. So pad board's the type of PCB um, prototyping board that has just a pad around each of the holes. And it means that you can quickly put together a circuit um, you can either join the pads using something like this tinned copper wire, or you can use some uh, prototyping wire. Um, it must be in a box at the moment, but um, you can also join it together with prototyping wire, really fine wire with just a Teflon coating. So this will be something that you can build yourself. I'm going to release the schematics and the source code. And the idea is that this clock is going to sit up here somewhere, and it will be driven from the GPS disciplined oscillator uh, but for today, we're just going to build this so it runs on its own, uh, just free running so that you can um, use that in your own labs. So clocks are something which I often find interesting to build. Um, I've built quite a few, but I actually have none in here. Um, there's an unfinished project down here, which is an OLED clock. So this is a 256 by 64 green 5.5 inch diagonal OLED display and I think Midas Displays and also Densitron sell this part. You can buy it from Farnell for about 60 or 70 pounds. And this wasn't really a clock project, this was just a development platform for when I was designing some code to drive these OLED displays. Um, but the first thing that I did on it was design this clock and I've never really touched that particular development board since. So this was just a board that I prototyped up with a PIC microcontroller on there and a Dallas 32 kilohertz temperature compensated oscillator. And actually this oscillator's kept really uh, good time. So this has been running for about two years and it's probably lost about five seconds over that time. So that's pretty good. Uh, but anyway, let's go down to the bench and we'll design our six digit LED display and then we'll build it up. So this is how I'm thinking of arranging the seven segment displays and then we'll use some red LEDs to create the colons uh, between the sets of digits. And then we'll probably use some of these pin sockets here and use these to, uh, we'll solder these into the board and then we can plug the displays in and out so that these aren't fixed onto the display but also it'll give us a bit of extra headroom so we can fit some components underneath the displays so the transistors or the Darlington drivers or whatever we use to drive these displays. The displays we're using for this clock are the Kingbright SA23-12SRWA and these are super bright red 2.3 inch displays with a common anode and then the segments are comprised of four red LEDs in series and then the decimal point is just two LEDs in series and these have a spectral peak at around 660 nanometers. So when we choose the LEDs for the colons between the digits, we just need to make sure that they're also a similar wavelength so they don't look out of place. So each of the segments has a typical forward voltage of 7.4 volts at 20 milliamps, and the decimal point has a typical forward voltage of 3.7 volts at 20 milliamps because it only has half the number of LEDs in the decimal point. And we're going to multiplex this display, which means that we're going to common up each of the segments on the digits so that we have a set of common anodes for the digits and then a set of common cathodes for the individual segments. And I'll explain a bit more about multiplexing later on. And when we actually start writing the code, we'll slow it right down so that you can see the multiplexing as it happens on the display um, so that you can understand how it actually works. And then we're not going to do anything fancy for driving the displays. So for the cathode drivers, I'll probably just use something like a ULN2803, which I have the data sheet for here. And they've done a simplified um, block diagram of the chip itself. And it's basically just a set of eight Darlington drivers. They've drawn it here as some inverters because that's basically what it is, although it can't drive the output high. Um, but um, it's basically an array of Darlington transistors and then we'll have a current limiting resistor on each of those. And then for the anode drivers, we can just use a PNP transistor or a P-type MOSFET and then drive 
that from the logic level because we have to do some voltage translation uh, just using some open collectors so possibly another set of 2803s or maybe just some discrete NPN transistors. So the reason we can't drive this PNP transistor directly from the microcontroller is because the forward voltage is actually quite high at 7.4 volts and higher than the supply voltage of the microcontroller. If we were to just connect this directly to the pin on the micro, we wouldn't actually be able to turn this transistor off because we wouldn't, wouldn't be able to bring it all the way up to uh, VLED so that the voltage drop across the emitter base junction is less than 0.6 volts. So what we do here is we uh, pull the transistor high with a pull-up resistor and then when we want to turn the transistor on we can bring this down to ground with an open collector NPN transistor. So now we just need to do a little bit of maths to work out some of the parameters of the circuit and because we're multiplexing the displays only one of the six digits is on at once as it scans through each of the six digits which means that the actual duty cycle for any given digit is only 16%. So that means if we were to drive our LEDs at 20 milliamps the average current through that LED would only be 3 milliamps, so 20 divided by 6. Um, so obviously it would be a lot dimmer than you were expecting. So what you do is you drive the LEDs at a higher current so that you get your original brightness back. You make sure that the average power dissipated in each of the LEDs is not exceeding the maximum in the datasheet. So in the datasheet there's always the peak forward current specified. So the data sheet here specifies 155 milliamps um, at a one tenth duty cycle and the pulse width has to be a maximum of 0.1 milliseconds. So from that we can work out the maximum allowable power to be dissipated in each of the segments is 125 milliwatts. So if we were to try and get our 20 milliamp average current back we just drive the LEDs at 120 milliamps so 6 times 20 and that would mean that our power dissipation is 150 milliwatts, so slightly higher than what we'd want. Um, so you can also look at that at 15 and 10, and either 15 milliamps or 10 milliamps would both give us um, suitable power to be dissipated in the LEDs. So for now we'll run with the 10 milliamps, which means that our peak anode current with each of the segments lit would be 480 milliamps. And then we just need to work out the minimum supply voltage. So in our circuit we've got the voltage drop across the LEDs, we've got the voltage drop on the cathode drivers, the voltage drop on the PNP anode drivers, and then we've got a voltage drop on our current lim limiting resistor, and these all have to equal less than the supply voltage. So we'll take the LED forward voltage to be 8 volts. The datasheet specified a typical 7.4 volts at 20 milliamps, but we're going to be driving the LEDs quite a bit harder. So we'll take that as 8 volts. And then we've got the collector emitter saturation voltage on the cathode drivers. And this is in the datasheet specified as 0.9 volts at 100 milliamps. And then we've also got the saturation, collector emitter saturation voltage on the PMP transistor. And again, this is in the data sheet and specified as 0.7 volts. And this is equal to 9.6 volts. So our supply voltage has to be greater than 9.6 volts plus whatever voltage drop across our current limiting resistor. So this looks like we can drive our clock from a 12 volt supply. So to start with, I'm going to recreate this circuit here. So I'm going to solder in the pin headers and connect them all up so we've got our set of common cathodes and common anodes and then I'll rejoin you at that point. Right, so I've soldered up part of the circuit now. So at the top and bottom of the board you can see we've got the sockets for the seven segment displays and the displays themselves have five pins at the top and the bottom and these just plug into these sockets. And then you can also see I've soldered in uh, four two pin sockets for the colon LEDs so we can just plug some LEDs in there and then at the top here we've got seven PMP transistors for driving the anodes so uh, one on each of the displays and then we've also got one driving the four colon LEDs which are wired in series and then next to each transistor we've got a pull-up resistor 
and then a base current limiting resistor and then we've got a ULN2003 which is driving the seven PMP transistors. And then just to the left here we've got the ULN2803 which is an 8 channel version of the ULN2003 for driving the cathodes on the displays. And then just to the left of that I've soldered in some little test terminals which you'd normally use um, on your first spin of a PCB if you want to be able to probe easily with an oscilloscope and they've just got a little loop. And what I'm doing that for is so that we can uh, solder in some different values of resistors because, uh, because we're overdriving these displays by quite a significant margin. Uh, while we're developing the code, there's a good chance that uh, we may end up overdriving the displays because one of the digits gets left on or something like that when we're debugging the code. So I can solder in some high value resistors to limit the current to uh, something more sensible like 20 milliamps. And then once we've got the circuit running and the watchdog timer enabled, we can then drop the value so we drive these at their peak forward current. And then on the back of the board, I've just wired everything point to point, uh, mainly with Kynar wire, um, which is this stuff here, which I was looking for earlier, which is a really fine wire. You can either buy this with a Teflon coating or um, the Kynar coating. I think uh, if you buy it with Teflon, it's called Tefcel instead. Uh, but this is really good stuff. It's um, really nice to prototype with, and generally it holds its shape on the board. So this is often used for PCB modifications. And all I've done is just um, soldered everything point to point and then just tacked the wires in place every so often with uh, hot glue just to stop it all um, flapping about. But next we've just got to choose a microcontroller for it. So I've just quickly summarised what I've done on the PCB. And you can see we've got the PMP driver transistors for the common anodes with a 10k pull-up and a 2k base resistor and we've assumed a current gain of about 100 so with a collector current of 500 milliamps with all of the um, segments illuminated uh, we want about 5 milliamps to flow through the base which is about 2k and we've got the ULN2003 which is driving each of the digits and then we've got the ULN2803 which is driving each of the segments and then we've got our current limiting resistors here and we've got the four red LEDs forming the colons. So I've had a quick look in my collection and I've got a couple of PIC 18F26K20s and these are just 8-bit um, microcontrollers. I don't think there's anything particularly special about these but uh, they have an internal oscillator which will run up to 64 megahertz with the PLL and it also has two pins which we can attach a 32.768 kilohertz watch crystal to so that we can uh, do the real-time clock functions on the processor and it's got more than enough pins so we need eight pins to drive the segments and seven pins to drive the digits and then we probably want a couple more pins so uh, we'll probably add a couple of tactile switches for setting the time even though I'm eventually going to drive this from the GPS and then we'll also have the programming pins and the power pins so 28 pins should be uh, just about enough so I'll just decide how I'm going to wire this all up I'll solder this onto the board and then I'll just update the diagram with the connections to the microcontroller and then we just need to have a quick think about um, the power supply for the board and then we can start programming so I was just having a look through my collection for a suitable 32.768 kHz watch crystal and I came across a Maxim DS32 kHz temperature compensated crystal oscillator which I bought quite a long time ago and this is in a little SO16 package so I'll need to use a little adapter board but I think I might use this on the clock here um, just because otherwise it's never going to get used. Um, you just supply power to the supply pins and then you get your 32 kilohertz square wave output from pin 1. And it has a reasonable stability. I think this is uh, plus or minus 2 ppm between 0 and 40 degrees C. So it should keep time quite well. Um, so I just solder that up and add that to the clock. So I was in two minds whether or not to put this part of the video in. This is me soldering the temperature compensated oscillator onto an adapter board. And I'm using some liquid flux here and a 30 degree hoof tip from Metcal 
specifically for this application. And the idea is that you wipe the iron across the legs of the IC and the flux helps the solder wick between the pads of the board and the legs of the IC. And then I'm just cleaning up here with some IPA alcohol. And then this is the other side of the IC and I'm applying liquid flux again here and I'm going to solder each leg individually with a chisel shaped tip. So this didn't go quite as well as I'd have liked. I think I was using very slightly too much solder here and the fillets of solder between the leg and the copper pads are slightly blobby on a couple of those connections although they do clean up not too badly but I have done neater connections in the past. Right, so I've completed soldering everything onto the board now. It's taken slightly longer than I'd hoped, so this is actually midweek now. And I have actually drawn up a schematic of the clock, so I'll link this in down below. This is on my website, and I'll also briefly write up um, the clock on the website. But um, you can see now we've got all of the components on here. We've got the microcontroller, uh, we've got a couple of uh, capacitors, we've got a 3.3 volt regulator, some switches for setting the time. And then if we have a look on the other side, um, you can see we've got the bulk capacitor for the 12 volt supply. Um, we've got the um, temperature compensated crystal oscillator. And then there's a header here for the RS-485 connection to my GPS disciplined oscillator. So you can also see uh, on here I've also put an RS-485 transceiver. And that's about it really. There wasn't too much to add, it just took a lot longer than I'd hoped just to uh, wire everything up. So I'll show you what I've done for the power supply. So the microcontroller that I use needed a 3.3 volt supply and I've assumed that we need approximately 60 milliamps on the 3.3 volt rail just in case I was going to add any uh, status LEDs or anything else to the board. So using the LP2950-33 regulator which is a TO92 packaged fixed output 3.3 volt regulator, it would mean that at full current would be dissipating about half a watt in a TO92 package, which is probably quite unacceptable. So what I've done is I've paralleled up three 330 ohm resistors to give a 110 ohm resistor. And this will mean that at 60 milliamps will actually be dissipating the majority of the power in these three resistors while still maintaining a high enough input voltage to the regulator that it is regulating properly. And then obviously, as you draw less current, less power is being dissipated in the uh, regulation circuitry anyway. So the balance changes slightly here, but it should be uh, within acceptable limits. And then I've just got some smoothing capacitors on the input and output. So this is um, this area here. So I've got the TO92 packaged um, regulator here. We've got the capacitors for bulk storage, and then I've got a group of three 330 ohm resistors slightly off the board, just so a bit of airflow can get around them. Um, but these are quarter of a watt rated, so that means we could dissipate up to three quarters of a watt in these three resistors. And the maximum that we're actually going to dissipate is about 400 milliwatts, so that's perfectly fine. And then just a quick look through the schematic, but as I said, I'll post this on my website so you can uh, download it and recreate it for yourself if you want. So we've got the anode drivers at the top here through a ULN2003A going into uh, the microcontroller here. We've got the six seven segment displays with the uh, cathodes going into the cathode driver through some resistors here, and they then go straight into the microcontroller. We've got the 32.768 kilohertz oscillator, which feeds directly into the Time One uh, clock input. And then we've got some switches here for setting the time and then some debouncing here, although we're going to do some debouncing in the software. We've got the header for in circuit serial programming and then finally the RS485 transceiver and header and also a couple of pins for adding the termination resistor if it's the only device on the bus. And then here we've got the 12 volt power input with a capacitor. I've actually added in a series diode just to provide some reverse polarity protection. So we should be able to power this up now and just check that we're getting um, suitable supply voltages everywhere. Uh, for now, I've just soldered in 1K resistors into um, 
the section here so that we can uh, happily leave the segments turned on on the displays and not cause any damage. So I'll just hook this up to the bench power supply and we can just check that we're getting our 32 kilohertz and the 3.3 volts and 12 volts everywhere and then we can um, try writing some software for this. Right, so I've set the bench power supply up to 12 volts and it doesn't seem to be drawing any excessive current so we haven't got any dead shorts anywhere. So we should have 3.3 volts on the power to the pick, which is up here, which we do. And the memory clear pin should also be high at 3.3. And then the RS485 transceiver should also have 3.3 volts. And then the anode drivers, the emitter of the transistor, should have about 12 volts which is about right. So we seem to be getting power everywhere. So we should now be able to connect um, to the microcontroller. We'll also just check that we've got 32.768 kilohertz output from the temperature compensated oscillator. So if I put this on, I think it's this pin here. Yeah, and we're getting 32.768 kilohertz out from there. So we should be able to load up MPLAB now and connect to the board. All right, so I've got the board powered up and I've plugged in all of the displays and I've put in some red LEDs for the colons. And then I've got the MPLAB ICD3 connected to the programming header. So we should now be able to connect to this in MPLAB. So I've been working on the code for this offline, I've not yet tried it on the board, um, but in the source code I've kept everything to one file, so I've created main.c just so that I can share this on the website easily without people having to deal with loads of source files. So at the start of the code we've got the configuration words which just set the system to use the internal oscillator, uh, the brownout reset is turned on, uh, for now the watchdog timer is turned off, and then basically code protection is also turned off. And then if we scroll down to the initialization section um, just here. So at the start of the initialization, we've got the internal oscillator configuration. So the internal oscillator is set up for 16 megahertz, and then we turn on the times four PLL, which gives the 64 megahertz, and then that divides back down to 16 million operations per second. So that's full speed for this microcontroller. Then we configure the analog pin, so we're not using any analog pins, so we've set everything as digital inputs. And then we just set up the input and output buffers so um, all of the pins are set to digital output except for the three buttons being used to set the time, the RS485 input and also the input for the 32.768 kilohertz crystal and then after that we configure timer one so this is timer one that's being used for the real-time clock and this just sets it up to use RC0 as the time base which is our temperature compensated crystal oscillator and then timer two is configured with the prescaler and postscaler and the period match register to give interrupts at 1.5 Zero one kilohertz, which was as close to 1.5 as I could get, and that means that we can refresh the entire display at a rate of 250 hertz. And then we just do a bit of initialization here of some global variables, and then we enable the appropriate interrupts. So the only interrupts we're interested in are timer one and timer two, where timer one is the RTC and timer two is for multiplexing. So here we have the interrupt routine and on the 18 series picks there are not separate interrupt vectors for all of the interrupt sources so when you come into your interrupt you have to determine what the interrupt source was. So first of all here we've got uh, the test here to see if the timer 1 interrupt flag was set and the interrupt was enabled and if it is then we know that this is the RTC interrupt. So the first thing that we do is set the upper two most bits of the timer one counter and this means that we get interrupts at a rate of two hertz. So the colons on the clock I want to flash um, and that needs to be done at two hertz and then every alternate timer that we enter this interrupt we increment the RTC counter. So here we increment seconds ones. So I've created a structure here um, called local RTC and I've separated out uh, ones and tens for both for all of the seconds, minutes, and hours. 
So I've done this to simplify the real-time clock code so we don't have to deal with any BCD conversion. We've got a separate variable for uh, ones and once that is greater than nine, we can increment the tens of seconds. And once that's greater than five and the seconds is greater than nine, we can roll over the minutes. And we just repeat that all the way along here um, to eventually once we roll over from 23 hours, we reset back to zero hours. And then we have the timer two interrupt. So again, we check to see if the interrupt flag is set and the interrupt is enabled. And we're coming into this interrupt at a rate of 1.5 kilohertz. And what we do is we enter this switch case statement with the variable current digit. And the idea is that every time we enter the interrupt, we turn off all of the digits and then we activate the next one in the sequence and then apply the correct segments to the digit so that it displays the correct number. So first of all we come in and service the uh, tens of hours. At the start of the interrupt we turn off all of the digits, then we load in the appropriate uh, bit field into uh, port A which is used for displaying the segments on the display and then um, we turn those on. Um, we also got a bit of code here in the first two just to deal with the colons flashing. Um, and then we increment the variable current digit so that the next time that we come into the interrupt, we then service hours ones. And then the next time after that, minutes tens, minutes ones, seconds tens, and then finally seconds ones. And then if there's ever a default uh, where it doesn't meet one of these cases, we just reset uh, back to hours tens. And then finally, I've just written some code here to allow us to set the time with the three tactile switches. So this is the only thing that's in the main loop. Everything else just runs in interrupts. So the first thing that we do is check to see if any of the buttons have been pressed. If no buttons have been pressed, then we just loop back round again. If they have been pressed, then if it's the seconds button that's been pressed, we just reset uh, the number of seconds that has been accumulated. If the minutes button has been pressed, then we increment the number of minutes. So this is basically the same code as the RTC code. So we increment the minutes. And if it rolls over from nine, then we increment the tens of minutes. And if we uh, roll over from five tens of minutes, we go back to zero. And then the same thing again if the hours button's pressed. And you'll notice at the start of the main loop, we've got a function called check buttons. And I've written a function here, basically, which checks the status of the buttons and then depending on how long that button has been pressed, it speeds up the, um, the time setting so that as you hold down the button, it gets faster so that you can scroll to higher numbers quicker. So that's basically the overall uh, layout of the code. So we should now be able to flash this onto the board and it should work. I've not actually tried this, but everything seems to be in order. So we should be able to program this onto the board. So we'll see if the processor is detected. And the ICD is now connecting. Um, it's just given a warning because the PIC18F26K20 is actually a 3.3 volt part. The majority of PIC18Fs are 5 volt devices, so it's just a warning there. But the device seems to be found, programming, and it's completed. So you can see the colons are flashing correctly, and this seems to be counting up. The numbers are all yeah, the numbers are all correct, so I managed to get the segments all in the right order. So we'll just try setting the time. Um, so if I press the hours button, yep, yeah, the hours is incrementing. And it gets faster as you hold it down. What about the minutes? Good, so that seems all right. We'll just see if it rolls over to uh, midnight correctly. And this still has the one kilo ohm resistors for current limiting, because uh, I wasn't actually sure whether it would work properly or not. So this is the first time that I flashed this onto the, onto the uh, microcontroller. So it's quite surprising so far that it's all working correctly. Um, and I wasn't sure whether it was stall on any of the digits. So uh, these are one kilo ohm resistors. We should be able to decrease those right back down to 51 ohms so that the digits are at full brightness. Um, so in a moment, I'll add in, some, add in some code to the multiplex routine. 
yeah, that rolled over correctly. I'll add in some code to the multiplexing routine just to slow it down so you can see how it scans across the display, but uh, everything seems to be working. So I'll add all of this to the website, which I'll link down below, and then you can um, have a look at the code and the schematic for yourself. And there you go. So this is slowed right down, and you can see it's just scanning through each of the digits. And all that the multiplexing routine is doing is doing this at a much higher rate. So, um, so it completes the whole thing at a rate of 250 hertz so that you don't see it um, to the naked eye. So I should be able to increase the rate at which it multiplexes just by changing this number here and reprogramming. So that's multiplexing much quicker now, but still visible to the human eye. And if I speed it up again, And we're getting a slightly odd effect at this uh, particular frequency on the camera. That looks quite cool, actually. Um, that's almost, uh, I think that's about 65 hertz. And now we're at 125 hertz. And now we're back at full speed. So I've now replaced the current limiting resistors on the clock with the lower value ones. So the segments are being driven at a much higher current. It's drawing about 200 milliamps for the whole clock on the bench power supply, although obviously that depends on what's being displayed on the clock. Uh, but the digits are really quite bright now, although on camera it doesn't look like um, there's very much contrast between digits that are turned on and off. And Hopefully that should be rectified when I build a case for this. So this week I'm going to try and get a case made. And I've got some smoked acrylic which should really improve the contrast um, and really make it quite visible. I probably won't do a video on making the case but you'll see it in a, in a week or so probably once it's hanging uh, from the shelf up here. So on the website I've put the schematics, the source code and a write-up and obviously some photos of the clock. So you should be able to build your own clock if you want to using the materials that I provided. And hopefully some of you will um, reply with some comments on my website uh, for any clocks that you've built or any questions that you have. So I hope you enjoyed that video and some of you found that useful. Uh, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already and give a thumbs up. Comments down below and thanks for watching.